to examine ourselves. I asked Peggy as we were driving in this morning from the other mountain. Came down the hill by the lake. And I said, Peggy, what would you do if you looked over at the lake and saw somebody struggling for their life in there? What would you do? And you I said, well, we would, we would know immediately maybe they've got 120 seconds before it's too late. If they don't go under right now, we don't know how long they've been flailing, but the water's cold enough, probably 120 seconds, it's going to be over. We need to take action now. So we're both swimmers, so we would find a way to get in there, hopefully, and yell along the way or call 911 and get somebody on, you know, call for help and then plunge in. And if you look at that picture back there today, it is the depiction by Mauricio Palicio, and yes, it is a real name, and he is a real artist, who depicted in that picture and captured the story that General William Booth had. He said, I had a vision and I saw this. General William Booth, if you don't know who he is, is the founder of the Salvation Army in 1865 in England. And I think it's just significant that God used him the way he did. He and his wife, Catherine Booth, founded the army and it's still going strong today. Yeah. And he had this vision, and the vision's depicted there of people who were drowning in the sea, and the waves are crashing, and this big rock comes up out of the water, and at the base of the rock is a platform on which people are safe. And he thought, what is this? And he realized that the rock was Jesus, and the platform were though on the platform were those that he had already rescued out of the sea, but all around this rock and platform, people are plunging around in the water trying to find life. And there were only a few people on the dock that were still struggling, realizing they had been pulled from the waters that were reaching back to get others out. A couple had launched a little skiff out on the side and they were out trying to help and somebody's throwing a life preserver out. But the others on the platform, unfortunately, are just living in pleasantness. Living in a passive, watered down, powerless Christian experience. Saved on the platform, doing fine, but I'm on my cell phone or I'm on my laptop or I'm just fishing off the dock. And you look at it and I hope it'll impact you. I had a video that I want to show. And in fact, if you want to see the video of this yourself, somebody put it to a little YouTube. You can go on when you get home. Just put in who cares booth and you'll find a five and a half minute video that'll turn that painting to life for you for a bit and tell you the content of William Booth's vision. We need to examine ourselves. Am I in the faith or do I just have it? Is it in me? Is it alive? Is there a kingdomness about my life that reaches to others that really cares? Because I understand that everybody in this picture, for example, everybody that's not on the rock is in the water and everybody that's in the water is perishing. If they don't know Christ, we cannot fool ourselves. William Booth said this, don't fool yourself, Christian. If they're not on the rock, they're in the water. If they're not saved, they are lost. I'm not raising my voice to yell at you. I want to be clear. I live right next door to my older brother. We have lived next door to each other for a few decades by now. We even grew up in the same home. (laughs) So we're still close. But there isn't a week that goes by that I'm not curious of whether or not he's actually going to heaven. You would think, what? Get over there. Exactly. I've been over there a few times. I do visit my brother. He comes over sometimes. But somehow he's afraid to come in my house. He stands at the door. It's weird. Is this recorded? (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Me. Maybe he'll hear it someday. (laughs) And by then, hopefully, it'll be a a fun thing. But I need to have that concern, right? My family, the people I love, if they are not saved, if they do not accept Christ as their Savior, even here this morning, if you have not asked Jesus to be your Savior, the Bible simply says you are lost and eternity is coming. And eternity is forever and ever and ever. You're either with Jesus or you're separate from him. 
but he loved you enough to die in your place, to put himself on a cross, take your sins, as we sang about this morning, put them in his own body and die there for you. In fact, I like what one guy said, and I'm going to keep this, said, Jesus didn't die for you. He died with you because he took you to the cross with him. He took your sins and your life and your wrongness and your brokenness and your unhealedness and your poverty and your mental issues. He took it all into his own body and he took you and I and he nailed it to the cross forever and he overcame it by coming out of the grave. What's our message when we tell people the truth about Jesus and salvation? Paul sums it up in 1 Corinthians 15. So moreover, brothers, I declare to you the gospel, gospel, good news. I give you the good news, which I preached to you, which also you received and in which you stand, by which also you are saved if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas and then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by over 500 brothers at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have died. After that, he was seen by James and then by all the apostles. Then last of all, he was seen by me also as one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles. I'm not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. What do we believe? That Jesus died for our sins, that he was buried, that he rose again, and that he's coming. He's coming. And when he comes, he's coming for us. But will he come for my brother? He wants to come for my brother. Will he come for my sister? Will he come for my aunts and uncles? Will he come for what the Bible calls our oikos? Have you heard this word, oikos? It's a Greek word that means those people who are familiar to you. It's the people you live with every week. In fact, one individual, uh, the Brickmans have defined it this way that says, your oikos includes all the people with whom you spend more than one hour a week and have influence in their life. So this would include the people at work. So include your neighbors, your family members, your friends. You can find this in Acts chapter 10 when Peter comes to the house of Cornelius. You remember this passage? Have you read that? Where Cornelius has a vision, calls for Peter, Peter shows up and in Acts chapter 10, it says that Cornelius, in anticipation of Peter's arrival, has gathered all of his relatives and his friends. And there's a group at the house waiting for Peter. When we talk about having life groups and home meetings and small group meetings, we're doing the same thing. We're getting together in a place that we can invite somebody to come and hear truth. We're giving them a safe place. We're finding a place for Erin to meet with us when she's not at work. She may never speak to me after telling on her this morning. <laughs> the lifestyle of a kingdom gospel where Jesus is king and Jesus is Lord is one that says he indwells me. Jesus sent us to preach. And he said, go everywhere. He told his disciples, go everywhere and preach this. What did he say? Preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven is among you. John the Baptist, when he came preaching, that's the first message he preached. Repent, the kingdom is arriving. When Jesus came out of the wilderness, the first thing he preached when he got to Capernaum was repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Why is the kingdom of heaven at hand? Because the king lives inside of you. Wherever you go, the kingdom goes. It's a kingdom that is all around the world, but it's not in one geography. You can't draw lines around it because you have to draw lines around people and say, there's the kingdom, there's the kingdom, there's the kingdom, there's the kingdom. When I walked in this morning to get a little fuel from Aaron, 
The kingdom was there because I, it walked in with me. He never leaves me, he never forsakes me. He says, I'll always live inside of you. Well, I just don't love people the way some others do. Well, you can. You can develop a care for people. Let God give you an image of them drowning right in front of you and say, you're the only one in the neighborhood that knows how to swim. Jump in after them. The kingdom lifestyle says repent. The kingdom of heaven is near and it's in me. I I won't do it again. That's page (laughs) two. Page two. Is anybody here interested in seeing Crestline First Baptist Church grow? We are. It's exciting news. I mean, that really excites me. Well, because there are churches that kind of like it the way it is. You know, it's just full enough. It's good. You know, in the potlucks, there's always enough food. Uh, there's not too many of us racing out to the restaurant afterward. Or, you know, when we get, get together, it's, it's comfortable. I mean, there are churches that think that way. But if we want the church to grow, I have to ask the question, what makes churches grow? Yeah, new life. People getting saved. People coming to Christ. Adding new believers. We don't want what's called transfer growth, Right? Yeah, I'm sure we've had that. I know at, at my church I pastored, I had plenty of that. Transfer growth is, you know, all the people that come in looking like they're the stellar next youth leaders or whatever, and you go, man, these guys are great. My wife's elbowing me and saying, give it a couple of weeks. <laughs> and she had the wisdom, I'm telling you, I was just happy somebody was there. And they looked like they had something to offer. Like, yeah, did you hear them singing? I think they could be our worship leaders. You know, just, just wait a second. She's like, wait a couple weeks. And you'd find out that they were just transferring from another place in town, got upset at the pastor, got a falling out in the nursery leader, and we're just, you know, shaking the dust off our feet and going to another church. And I'm saying, great, come on here and spread that around. Like, time out, time out. I got to the point, in, and I actually used my brother as the example where people would come into the church and I'd say, oh, so you're from there. Yeah, yeah, well, you know what it's like over there. And I'd say, yeah, I know all the pastors in town. I've been here a long time. I've prayed with every one of them. (laughs) And I know that he's your dad. I'm just your uncle. We're brothers in Christ. Say, so it's okay if you wanna run away from home. You can run to your uncle's house. You can spend the night or two, but eventually I'm sending you back to your dad. They didn't come to second week, (laughs) right? They went and found someplace else that wouldn't tell them something. They said, hey, this is one family, and that's where God planted you. Don't run away from home and stay gone too long. They need you over there, and I don't need you here disgruntled, right? So if we're going to grow the church, what we want to see is we want to see Aaron get saved and be in a life group. We want to see... I, I turned the corner. I saw some of you guys down there having coffee this morning. I thought, hey, how about the coffee shop owners? Is that guy saved yet? How about the people down at the corner at the market and all the people that live around you? And how about your family members? Have we reached out to them yet without becoming discouraged? Because they're going to say no, right? People say no. That's okay. The Bible tells us that one plants and other waters, but hallelujah, God gives the increase. And every now and then we get to be the person that puts the sickle into the harvest and reap a soul or two into the kingdom. And if we could close our eyes and hear all of angels and all of heaven rejoicing at one coming home. Wouldn't you like to be the person responsible for a daily party in heaven? (laughs) Think of that. Hey, get up in the morning and say, hey, get ready. Get ready to party because today I'm going to invite somebody to know Jesus and they're going to say yes. And when I pray, I expect you to get with it. That's you in charge of angels. Churches only grow, and I I wrote this note, growing churches around the world have a life-giving commonality. And I think studies have been done, books have been written, I've read a few, I've hung around with people that have written them. They have a focus 
about sharing stuff. And I finally got to the title of the message. They have a focus that says we're going to share our stuff. And specifically, we're going to share Jesus. We're not going to keep him to ourselves. Everybody's heard of Dr. Cho in the church in Korea, right? Largest church in the world, all of that. Dr. Cho used to tell the people in his, in his small groups, say, you are not allowed. Now, he's a commander, okay? You are not allowed to share your faith with anyone until you have done six acts of kindness for them. And here, and he would give them ideas. You can watch their children. The, he, <laughs> I heard one of those little Korean ladies, she figured out what she would do because they have those big apartment buildings, right? And this whole towns live inside these apartment buildings. And you don't really know your neighbors because there's so many people. She stalked her neighbors. She would wait in, down and sit on a bench by the front door and she'd time. This lady goes to the grocery store every Tuesday and comes back at 10. And she always has more than she can carry. So she parked herself on the bench every time at 10. And when the lady would get out of her car, she'd stand up and say, can I help you? I notice you have quite a lot to carry. I'd like to help you carry. I think we live in the same building. And you get to know her. Help her with her groceries. Up the elevator. Off to her flat. Thanks. Okay. After about six times, she said, you know, you seem like a nice person. I have a little get-together at my apartment. And I just live on the next floor down over a couple doors. You could come. And we can have tea. And you can meet some of the other people around the neighborhood. Okay, I'll come. She was inviting her to her life group. That lady built a church inside that building riding the elevator. She did all she did. She said, this is so fun. She went and get back in the elevator and do it again. Catch somebody at the bottom. Hey, can I carry your groceries up? Can I watch your kids? Can I help you with your laundry? I see you're hanging out today. And she just began to act of kindness, act of kindness, act of kindness. And she became the leader of a congregation of 200 people inside that apartment building. Just because you got to be nice. <laughs> you got to be nice to people to let Jesus out. He's nice. Amen? He was nice to you when you didn't deserve it. I try not to look anywhere in particular when I say that. <laughs> we need to care sincerely about the future, and I'm sure we've all heard the kind of a trite phrase that says people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. It's true. People are longing in our culture for somebody to care about them individually and personally. And I believe, as I'm telling you that, that's why I see Erin's face in front of me because she's just the most recent experience I've had of looking at somebody and acknowledging how long have you been running this store? Not just, hi, thanks, give me the 10 bucks. Yeah, I need a receipt, see you later. I said, how long have you been running this place? And the smile just lit up her face like somebody actually cares. My, I've had people say, my boss doesn't care as much as you do. So I'm sorry for that, but I see a real person behind the cash register who just sees people all day long. Come, go, come, go, come, go. No relationship anywhere, just a lot of people, but nothing deep. I'm not deep either yet. But to be able to say, I think you're doing a great job, and I'm glad you got out of bed and came to work, because where would I be if you weren't here today? I'd be out there trying to figure this out on my own, and look at what you're doing. You're helping people. And just the smile got bigger and bigger and bigger. I said, well, Thanks a lot, got to go. But the door's hanging wide open for the next time I come back, don't you think? Yeah? And it can be for all of us. Just learn how to be nice to people. How to realize that they're over there flailing in the water and drowning, and nobody seems to be watching. But you could. You could be watching. Amen? You could be caring. You say, gosh, I'm just going to care about somebody today. the last page. <laughs> this one says introduction on it, so I think I'm done. <laughs> I want to thank you for letting me be here, and I haven't cried yet, so I usually do, right? Somebody's always handing me Kleenex around here. 
But I'm sincerely grateful for the opportunity to share with you this morning, simple truth. I hope that the Holy Spirit in my prayer goes beyond hope. I believe that the Holy Spirit wants to impart something to us supernaturally because really, you know, the preacher ain't that good. But he is. And maybe it won't happen here this morning, but maybe it'll happen next time you're at Costco or next time you're on the street ministry or next time you're in a prison or the next time you see somebody next to the road and you pull over and say, could I help you? And what we're really saying is, can I be Jesus to you? Do you need somebody to love you today? Don't I? You do. We need people to love us. We need people to care about us. This is a relational church, right? (laughs) Relational church that's sold out to Jesus. That's got to be our earmark. I mean, if, if... if I go anywhere in your town and say, do you know that church down there? The red one. Everybody knows the red one. <laughs> That's how I found it. No. <laughs> you know that church? There's a church down there somewhere by that coffee place. I think it's red. They go, oh, yeah, I know that church. I don't know what it is. I don't know the name of it. But I can tell you this. I've met some of those people over there, and they care about us. I don't know what they're doing over there yet, but I think they, those people really care about people. Wouldn't that be a great testimony to have and maybe you already have it I don't know that maybe I'll stop and ask Aaron on the way out hey you know that red place down the road 